everyone. Welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Ham Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for HGA, and I'll be your host today. Today, Textiles and Tea is sponsored by Shipper Publishing. This family-owned business publishes all things nonfiction. Be sure to check out all of their books, including their fiber books, at shipperbooks.com. We will take questions today. It'll be the last 15 minutes of the program. So if you would, please put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. Go ahead and put your comments in chat. We love seeing those, but the questions get lost unless they're in the Q&A. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Gerhard Nodell. He has contributed to and reshaped the fiber arts for more than 40 years. Early experiences in the theater design area resulted in his use of textiles as interior architecture. Remember that phrase when you look at his work, interior architecture. He's exhibited and taught around the world. He's widely known for his numerous commissions for contemporary architecture. For 25 years, he led the graduate program in fiber at Cranbrook Academy of Arts. And subsequently, he became the director. He now maintains a full-time studio practice in Pontiac, Michigan. His awards include the National Endowments for the Arts, the Japan American Friendship Fellowship, the Gold Medal Award from the American Craft Council. I could go on and on, but I think we should talk to Gerhard. What do you think? We're so excited to have him here today. Hey, Gerhard. Hello. How are you? Happy to see you. I am so glad you're here. So let's get started. What is your favorite tea? Constant comment, hot and cold. What is that? <laughs> Constant comment, hot and cold. Oh, that's a new one. I'll have to write that one down. That's great. <laughs> so tell us, how did you get started in fibers? Uh, well, uh, interesting question. Um, Let's start. I was a child soprano. How's that? Have you had one of those before? Um, same with the Los Angeles Opera Company up in uh, Carmen and La Boheme. And I loved being backstage in the theater. Uh, the environment was so fabulous. I never forgot that. And then uh, later on, trying to imitate my experiences in opera, I had a puppet theater and brought all the kids from the neighborhood in and entertained them with the, uh, the puppets that I had designed and made in an environment that was completely created by um, various textiles that I had picked up here and there. Um, I had a wonderful grandmother who sewed and did all of those things. And, you know, eventually in high school, I had a great experience that led me to become an art major in college at Los Angeles City College and UCLA. Both places were extremely influential. So that was really the beginning of it all. One thing leads to the next. Oh, that's true. Well, you have been involved with some really influential artists, not just fiber artists in your life. Who would you say are some of the people that have really influenced your art career? Uh, you know, uh, it, it's again, an interesting question that I, I don't think a lot about. Basically, I love to uh, associate myself with the work of people who keep changing, who keep evolving who ask okay. new questions, who keep, uh, uh, you know, opening new chapters to their work. Um, I mean, I years ago, I was very privileged early in my experience to meet people like Magdalena Abakanovich, world renowned for her extraordinary work, Jagodo Buic from Yugoslavia, uh, Peter and Ritzi Jacobi, the Romanian artists who did most amazing work and uh, here in the United States, Jack Larson, for example, the textile designer was very, uh, I, seriously impressed me by their determination, their skill, their interest, and their vision, their ability to see beyond where they were at the moment 
and uh, always reach for something beyond that moment. Oh, I can I can see that in you. Now, one thing I love about your work is that you approach it from different points. So you, you approach the um, historical, the symbolic, the functional, the sensual. Can you talk some about that? Sure. Um, perhaps uh, these examples uh, may offer some kind of clue to all of that. This is a work I did a uh, few years ago for Beaumont Hospital here in Michigan. Um, it's three panels. You're seeing uh, the one on the left and the one on the right and the one in the center. All three of them uh, join together to make a single work. Uh, the, the, the challenge was to create a memorial piece and something that spoke, from my point of view, to the soft side of healing. So many people think about, you know, the, the, the rigor of visiting doctors and getting advice and following the advice and then ultimately relying on someone else to take care of oneself. Um, I began to think about this more from the doctor's point of view, the reasons that they're involved and um, the, the kind of very subjective feelings that are involved in healing. I decided therefore to go to the garden as an image. And if you look to the left, you'll see that there are a series of floral elements in the background. At first I thought I would draw those myself. And then one day it occurred to me, why not use images that are created by someone else? and plant a garden with those images. And just in the way that the medical profession does not create the subjects that come to the doctors for help, here in this case, I would be creating an artwork that is based in something that another artist has set forth. Now, along with that, I was also interested in the involvement of the opinions of doctors in the hospital. And I asked them to give me a list of influential, influential people in the history of their profession that had influenced their work. And uh, so you can see in the lower portion of the, the piece is, are some of those names. The piece is actually made from textiles and various other materials. Um, and my goal was to reach back into the history of textiles to an area of, era of richness, complexity in woven fabric. And I was thinking particularly about uh, many of the Renaissance textiles that are richly woven with uh, many different weaves superimposed and then gold and silver used with silk and other materials and therefore this sense of layering that you see here. So I hope that kind of explains a little bit about this uh, whole idea about reaching into various zones, trying to kind of pull them all together into a single work. Finally, I should mention that the images of the flowers and the plant forms were done originally by Jacques Nizhdovsky. He's an artist, Central European artist who came to this country and worked here, published images of his work. And he had passed away when I went ahead and beginning uh, to do the work. But I contacted his widow who gave me the permission to use the images. And now when you go to the hospital, you even see the original 14 images that are framed on the wall adjacent to the piece. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Sorry, it's a long story, but that's- No, it's I'm wonderful, here. that continuation of him. That's great. Sure. Well, in 1975, you did a work called Parhelic uh, Path, which was accepted into the Lausanne Biennial, which is in Switzerland, or was in Switzerland. And was, what was your experience there? And how did this affect you? Oh my gosh, I was young <laughs> and uh, a little fearless. 
Um, well, isn't, had, it, isn't it a true story that you were told, oh, no, 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 you'll never get into that, and you just did it anyway? Well, Lausanne was one of those places, you know, it's kind of like was the mountaintop experience. And uh, I had met other uh, artists who had, were involved there, and um, I was fairly young at Cranbrook. I was at Cranbrook at the time, and I received an announcement about the show, and I thought, ah, heck, why don't I why don't I participate if I can? And so I began some experimentation with different materials and different ways of bringing a rectangle of cloth into the space of a room. And one thing led to the next until finally, I came up with this idea of creating the impression of two tapestries that were really wall hung, but by pulling the fronts of each of them toward the center of the gallery, they would expand so that the viewing audience could walk between them. In fact, that was so e exciting an observation, I mean, point of view that I had developed for myself. I used that then in a series of works that followed. But um, the effect, as you can see here, all of these panels were uh, woven on my uh, loom. And uh, the effect was very much of standing like at the bottom of a waterfall as you went between the pieces and feeling this cascade of textiles coming down to the place where you were the core, almost like the body of a butterfly um, in space. I love that. And you have a, a, a number of pieces that will you know, go back up toward the wall or you can pull them back out. And mm -hmm. There still works. It's not like, okay, we've put it away and it's no longer there. It stands on its own when it's pushed back also, right? Absolutely. The, the idea being that textile is a pliable medium, but most of the art that I had seen made with the textile medium was rather static, uh, sculptural forms or tap wall tapestries. And uh, I was really intrigued with bringing the aspect of movement into the work. And that's how all of this, you know, evolved eventually. Well, I have to say that I was so excited because I first met you in um, 2016. We have an image of you signing your book, um, oh. What If Textiles, oh, at Convergence in uh, 2016. The book came out in 2015. And one of the things that I read in this book that I found fascinating was that you were doing a commission um, that involved the architect John Portman and the auto icon Henry Ford II, and you were doing a very large piece, and that you ended up going to Churchill Weavers in Berea, mm -hmm. near and dear to my heart, and went to the University of Kentucky, and you, they helped you um, do the work for this piece, correct? Sure. Yeah, it was a, a, an amazing experience. Uh, one day I received a telephone call and it was from Henry Ford II's office. And I said, yes. <laughs> and the voice at the other end said, uh, Henry Ford would, and uh, architect John Portman who are building Renaissance Center in Detroit would like to meet with you about the possibility of you doing a work for them. Would you like to come downtown and, and join the meeting? Of course. <laughs> so I, I went down to see this mammoth building under construction. And I was able to stand in the space in the building, in, uh, of the building, as you can see on the right hand side, where John Portman said, We envision you doing something that hangs between that balcony up on top and the pool at the bottom, which was about 75 feet in height. Wow. I had never done anything that size. And he's, they finally said, are you interested? I said, ah, of course, <laughs> I'll give it a try. So I went back, worked in the studio for several weeks, and uh, finally did a presentation, which was welcomed by about 25 or 30 people sitting in a big room in downtown Detroit. They were enthusiastic about it. And then the next question is, how am I going to make it? And at that point, one of my students had suggested that she had been in Berea, Kentucky and visited the Churchill Weavers. And she said, why don't you consider going down there? So I met the new owners, Richard and Lila Bolando, presented to them the fact that I wanted to weave a textile that was made with a mylar warp, 
which was a new medium that I was using. Uh, really, I had not done very little work with it, but found even uh, mylar cut at 37, 32nd of an inch in width was strong, really strong in the weaving process. And so they finally said, well, we normally weave baby blankets for Saks Fifth Avenue and all that kind of stuff, but we'll be glad to try it out for you, which they did and it worked. And here you can see in the photograph, uh, I'm standing up there with the technician and we're uh, beaming on or just preparing the warp. Uh, early Which one on. is you? Mm -hmm. You in the white shirt? The tallest one. The oh, one okay, the plaid shirt? Hair. <laughs> the one the handsome the one, hair. yeah. And the plaid shirt, right. Uh, so it, it was really a great experience. Then the, the way the work got done is that I prepared two inch a wide satin ribbons uh, marking every inch of the length of all uh, nearly 50 panels that comprise the piece. I left them with the weavers and then they followed the instructions using the yarns that I had uh, obtained and so on. So they sent them back to me. I had to do all the flame proofing and the finishing at Michigan to then go down to Renaissance Center to do yeah. the installation. And you see the result called free fall that's on the right hand side of the screen. Now, Inspired kind of by the idea of taking a telephone book, cutting the spine off of it and dropping it from the balcony and just letting it reflect some sense of the movement of the air and the light and the space within that building. Uh, the building was pretty ponderous, concrete, heavy concrete and uh, massive scale. So this created a nice juxtaposition to all of that. Um, there, we've had people asking, what was that loom that they used? I've, I've been to Churchill. What kind of loom was that one that they it used? Was a loom, it was a loom that uh, uh, Mr. Churchill invented. He had uh, been uh, mm -hmm. in, in India and observed uh, weaving there. He actually proposed improvements to the Indian looms in the area in which he was working. And when he was transferred back to Berea, he saw people in the area, uh, in uh, Kentucky, uh, who had loons on their front porch. And he had the idea of bringing them together to create an economically viable situation that would involve their talents as weavers, but his inventiveness with, as far as the mechanics of the loom were concerned. So it's a, a fly shuttle loom. Uh, and, uh, you know, eventually they had 40 weavers working in that business, uh, great production. Unfortunately, no longer exists. Yeah. Okay, along with um, a lot of the architectural projects that you did in the 80s and 90s, you also developed um, a new woven work that was more representational. Um, mm -hmm. How did that come about? Well, uh, as I recall, I, was in Europe and uh, toward the end of the trip was in Paris where I visited the Cluny Museum where the lady and the unicorn tapestries are hanging. I stood in a gallery surrounded by those elegant, gorgeous tapestries that, and just imagined what it was like at the time of their making when people sat at a dining table enjoying one another and this environment which spoke a kind of rich poetry. A poetry in part created because there was a central figure in each of the tapestries, a woman who was reflecting in her gestures and her association with animals and other creatures, uh, the various senses, taste and smell and touch and so on. Uh, shortly after that, I was in Italy and standing before a, the church in Orvieto and saw two old men sitting on the stoop of the, 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 the church in front of this amazing facade that had gorgeous mosaics and carvings and the stories of the Bible and heaven and hell and everything you can imagine. And I thought to them, thought to myself, uh, I wonder if they come here frequently and they think that all old people around the world have this kind of environment to enjoy in the late afternoon sun. 
I returned back to Michigan to my studio in Pontiac shortly before the Super Bowl was to be given at the new Silver Dome in Pontiac. And the day before the event, I saw people standing in empty storeroom windows or shop windows along the main street. Many of the shops were empty, but had been converted into bars so people could walk the street and drink beer and so on. But it was so cold, it was January and people were standing in the windows and I photographed them. And when I looked at the photographs days later, I realized that these people embodied that town. That in turn inspired me to photograph other people who lived in the city of Pontiac all the way from the mayor to the editor of the, of the newspaper mm -hmm. to the hookers which hang out on the corner and the John, the guy who represented them. And eventually I made full size screen print images of those people which are incorporated into the Pontiac curtain which you see on the left. At the base of the curtain are images, abstractions of the various buildings along Main Street with references to the entrance of the building and certain markers that indicate tombstones and, that, and, the, and uh, the foundation stones for these buildings. I regarded the buildings as the faces of the owners of the building who created the buildings for commercial purposes but embodied themselves in that whole experience. Then from that point, I went on to a lot of other work. The piece on the right-hand side is uh, Guardians of the New Day, and they represent uh, various aspects of taking care of the earth. The figures are my colleagues at Cranbrook, uh, the head of printmaking, the then director of the academy, the head of sculpture, um, and uh, incorporating them into an environment of threads was the major goal here. How to create a tapestry for the 20th, 21st century, or then the 20th century. Uh, photography, which was created by printing images onto commercially woven tapes, and then after printing them on my print tables, taking them to the loom and weaving them into a very complex woven structure, uh, created the cloth as a, an environment for these individuals. And that was the goal, to see how I could embed subjects of my own time in this kind of a poetic environment. Oh, they're just gorgeous. Those are amazing. Um, <laughs> In the Images Now Proceed, uh, which was in 2009, mm -hmm. and Laughter After Laughter, one, two, and three, the ones on the right, um, you use a series of dots throughout some of this work. Um, when you start a new work, do you find that you can use the details from another work? And when you, when you do, is it because you like the visual, the symbolic? Like we'll see those again in Dinner Talk from 2011, which is a couple of years later. Can you talk oh, some about that? Yeah, go back to the other one, if you will, please. Uh, good. Um, yeah, uh, there was a point at which um, after 25 years of leading the fiber program at Cranbrook, I became director of the academy. And um, for 12 years, it was really difficult to maintain a full-time studio practice. So when I retired from that, it was kind of like a brave new world had opened up to me. And the big question, what to do next? The work on the left is one of the first pieces I did. Um, it's difficult to see because of the way this is photographed, but can you see these are in a, a group of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven panels that hang like carpet uh, samples in, when you go to the carpet store and you can lift each one of them separately. Um, I uh, found a, a, an old Japanese kimono with this X shape, X and O's on it, done and rendered in ikat and decided to make a series of works using that textile. And 
If you look closely on each of those panels, you'll see their pairs of pants. Do you see that? You really have, it's hard to see here, but those pants represent an army. And this is an army of angels. And I had to let the audience know that this was the beginning of my journey. So I said, hello friends, seven armies of angels wait for you to make the right moves. Now proceed. Now, how was I going to represent those letters? I went to a drawer and found a necklace that I had bought years ago in Amsterdam from Africa, little plastic discs. I said, uh-huh, I've never done anything with these, but let's cut it open, which I did. It had different colors in it, and they were then sewn onto the ground cloth in each case. From that point, I loved what happened. I then went to what you see on the, on the right-hand side, taking set three different types of fabric. And we were in an economic depression at the time. And I thought, how can I represent that? Well, I love good times and laughter. And so I decided to juxtapose that with the words after laughter. And that after laughter was the mood of that moment. So I did three pieces and you can see each of them has the, the same text superimposed on the textile. But I love the way in which the superimposition affected the X and O textile in the top, creating significant amounts of variation. And that just kind of led me on and on and on. So in the next slide, and uh, you can see a couple of uh, examples of work that came near the end of that series. This one is a conversation. And believe it or not, those are art critics that are sitting on the table. Uh, the heads of art, <laughs> art critics, they go around the textile which hangs through a, from the ceiling through a slot in the table. I designed those panels with this linear pattern and they were then, the linear patterns were uh, embroidered with the, the discs that are on both sides of the textile. And then I sent the image of that piece to 12 art critics and I asked them to criticize the work, to analyze it. It's a drawing, right? analyzed the drawing for me. And while they were doing that, I made this table and this series of 12 art critics. Now you can see on the right-hand side that the art critic stands upright and is looking out with his back turned to the art from the artwork that is behind them. The only way the art critic sees the work is if you lower it and then what does it look at? The bottom edge of the, the textile. The other part of this that's, I think, really wonderful is that each of the art critics speaks to the audience. So when you lower it, it will then read the criticism that it wrote. And the only way of what is so much fun is to lower all 12 because they all speak simultaneously. They're all doing their talking underneath the table while you, the viewer, have a chance to actually see the artwork unencumbered by the art critics. Another long story. <laughs> oh, that changes this piece completely. That's wonderful. That is so wonderful. I like that. Get out of the way and then I can see it. There you go. I love that. <laughs> um, now you have produced and are producing an amazing amount of work. Um, you are prolific. Now, do you find that your work just flows and you've just got ideas and just not enough hours in the day? Or are you more of a, I got to get this done and then I'm going to get this done and this, this done or a combination thereof? Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because you're basically asking where does inspiration enter the process of making things? Do you dare when you're in the middle of making something to be inspired by something you're not thinking about and take you off in a new direction? I think as with time and experience, you begin to learn how to use those ideas. And basically I, I 
think of a lot of what I do as kind of evolutionary. You know, one thing kind of begets the next, and that one sets up a question that is answered by another work. Sometimes a project requires producing a series of pieces to really express the idea. Other times a single object can do that. So um, yeah, there's no real set plan. I just like the idea. I feel I'm using my time usefully if I'm exploring something I don't know the answers to. That's the best. Well, you mentioned um, your role at Cranbrook. So when I think when people think of Gerhardt Nodale, they think of Cranbrook. And when they think of Cranbrook, they think of you. And would you agree that the two of you kind of, for lack of a better term, grew up together? I think while you were there, you became a stronger artist. You start doing more work, the commissions, you really grew. And I would have to say, I don't know that anybody would argue that Cranbrook grew under you and you brought it to where it is today. Would you okay. agree with that? Well, that's a very nice compliment. Thank you very much. But Cranbrook existed as a very renowned institution <laughs> long before I got there. But I did have an extraordinary opportunity, 37 years in the institution. Um, and this is a photograph of many of the alumni that I worked, students that I worked with, and some others at the time of my retirement from Cranbrook. One of the most memorable experiences, um, getting together with people who, with whom you share ideas. And Cranbrook is a place where the essence of the experience is really this risk-taking environment where one grows. And, you know, students who are ready for that experience and can devote two years to that investigation deserve a lot of respect and the institution has grown because of them. Do you stay in touch with some of your students or your co co-workers or? If any of them are listening to this, they know. <laughs> uh -oh. I know about a party that I'm staging in November. I've invited all of them to come to Michigan for a party. I mean, time has passed. Some of my students I worked with 50 years ago. So um, I just thought it would be fun to get together again. And th that's in the works. Oh, wonderful. That's wonderful. You want to come? Um, <laughs> well, talking again about Cranbrook, you went from an instructor at a very young age, right? You weren't, you had been I mean, teaching high school and then they asked you to come do this, right? No, no, no. no oh. I, yeah, I had some uh, college experience in between. Okay. Uh, California State University at Long Beach. Oh, okay. So you went to, you started teaching at Cranbrook, then you became the head of fiber and then the head of Cranbrook. Through all of that, how did that impact on you and your art? If nothing else, when you're the head of the whole program, you must have been limited on time. So how did that impact on you? Well, well, uh, let me just say, you can't do administrative work without drawing from similar resources that you draw from when you're in the studio. I discovered that fairly in the second year. And then finally, I decided it was much better to think about building a new building and doing major renovations and creating an international travel program and spending lots of money and good energy and all of that and do a good job with it and then bring it to an end while my fingers still move and my eyes were still working. So that's basically what the situation was. Oh, okay. The other thing that I noticed about you and in reading about you is travel is really important in your life. Mm. And when you travel, you do a variety of things. You do collecting, you just do exploring, you do teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and you're even a tour guide. I love that, that you, you've taken your family on tours. You took um, donors from, I guess, Cranbrook on tours, just a variety of people. So how did all of those roles work together for you? And if you hadn't done one of those, what do you think the impact on you would have been? I think anybody who travels the world knows that there's a lot out there away from home. And, uh, you know, I, my first experience in travel 
was when I was 18 and went to the jungles of Panama and then to San Blas Islands and then Havana with, as Castro was coming to power and, you know, and on and on. Oh my God, it was fabulous. I saw a witch doctor's house, which I never imagined. I saw in San Blas all the women wearing those gorgeous kind of uh, outfits and were gold and oh, that was really neat. I wanted more of the exotic in my life and I love that. And maybe that comes from the opera background. I don't know where it originates, but I love the idea of being in places where I feel exhilarated, where I'm just delighted that somebody else has created an experience that seems to have been made for me even though it reflects hundreds of years of human history in Indonesia or in China or in Japan or, or Europe, wherever, um, there is, the world is a great place. Unfortunately, we're, there are some limits right now, but beyond that, there are too many tourists going to the most wonderful places <laughs> and messing it up with their presence there. I want it all to myself, as most people do when they visit. But I think if one can travel with eyes open to being, uh, you know, influenced, impressed, and figuring out how to create relationships through one's work with the feelings that are generated in those places, it can lead to a lot of new work. That's great. I love that. Um, you you still weave, right? You still sit down at the loom and weave. You haven't lost touch with that, have you? What do you want a picture that proves it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's my loom. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not weaving right now because I'm doing working with other techniques, but it's all there, tons of yarns, everything that I need to do, whatever I need to do. Um, so yes, weaving is still important. And actually, I, I think the question is appropriate relative to the Hand Weavers Guild of America, <laughs> who is sponsoring this, this session, um, because I, uh, I really believe that there are, you know, intrinsic qualities within the constructed textile that are unique to this medium. And those qualities are transferable to other techniques as well. Once you understand what this engagement of threads is all about and kind of the mystery and image and interest that can be generated by them, uh, it, it stays with you. Uh, so yeah, I'm going back to the loom one of these days. I love that. We love it that you, even though no matter how big and you get these people to help you that you still sit down at the loom. We love that, that's sure. good. <laughs> Now, can you tell us this new project that you just completed? Um, you've, you've got a new book out called The Minglings. Can you tell us about the motivation of this book? Oh, sure. Uh, it just arrived. <laughs> it just arrived yesterday. From yes, the you heard it here first, folks. You book is here, here. <laughs> ready to be seen. First, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, <clears throat> Minglings is really... Um, it's something that I had to do because I've, I have been on a journey for the last maybe four years, four, four and a half years that I never knew I would take. Um, I had uh, a couple of major exhibitions back at the beginning of this whole project. And when the exhibitions were finished, I returned to the studio and um, decided that I would begin a body of work that I could not imagine at that point. Well, how do you do that? Turn, go to the next slide and maybe we can, I'll walk you through a few things. So I was cleaning in the studio and um, I have all sorts, I have a very big historic textile collection, but the piece in the upper left is the only piece I have in my collection that I don't know the source of. Where, how did I get it? I, you know, it's a complete mystery. It's a piece of silk, of silk tapestry weaving that is about two feet wide, two by three feet. It has all these exotic uh, birds and butterflies and flowers floating against this beautiful blue background. 
It was in terrible condition. As I said, I don't know where I got it. I kept it in a plastic bag. But on this occasion, I took it out of the bag, looked at it and said, I'm not putting it away. It's not valuable. It's late Qing period, late 19th, early 20th century, probably made for tourist thing. I got out my pair of scissors, put some heat bonding on the back of it and cut out the parts that were useful. Look to the right now, top right image. On the right hand side, in the center, the center panel, on the left side, you can see an image where there is a shape in the center and some linear extensions. That was the first drawing I did. I pasted one of the fragments to a piece of drawing paper and then played a game of exquisite corpse where the image was simply extended uh, with my drawing. The objective was to discover something new. So the second, look at the second panel. Do you see the, the little fragment is high up in the right hand corner? And then the little detail on that fragment inspired the rest of what I drew. And when I drew that, I connected it to the first, uh, thinking why not find these relationships and start rebuilding that original textile. Panels three and four were interesting. There's a little creature toward the bottom made of butterfly wings, which is the real tapestry, and my drawing on the right-hand side. And when I did that, I felt as though I had produced something that the original Chinese designer could have produced, but that image was not part of his or her vocabulary. And at that moment, I was extending my hand through time and space to somebody maybe a hundred years ago and connecting. Ah, oh, that was so important for me. The reason being that I'm so concerned with history in the worldview these days. Young people, are they interested in history? Who remembers it? Who memorizes facts and dates and images and so on, which was part of my experience as a student. But I think in history, there is so much to be, to be learned and to, to exercise our day-to-day -day experiences. So I just went ahead with it. And I did, I completed that first series. Then I did the second one at the lower, on the lower shelf, the third series of drawings on the top shelf, and then got to work translating some of those new images into actually, uh, into textile form. Uh, on the lower left, you can see an example that is called a mingling. And it is made of layers of, of textile which I've sandwiched together around a felt core and then use a pair of scissors to cut tabs and in almost a mosaic fashion, pull fields of uh, these tabs together with other uh, techniques. All of those, that technique is used on all of those large panels that you see on the lower right. Uh, these are all new characters that emerged I would never have ever in my life come to these creatures had I not had that original textile fragment to work off of. And in those large pieces, you can see I've reproduced with the, the textile fragment with photography. So these are actually photographs that can be lifted out of the, the large structure. Okay, next slide. And here on the left-hand side, are three very large pieces that depict a journey. I discovered through the help of a scholar, John Bomer in New York, the fact that my textile was made in China but was never used there. It was put on boats in Macau and Portuguese boats sent to Portugal where it was used to make bed hangings and bed covers for very wealthy people. And because of the fragile nature of the silk tapestries, they, these did not survive. So the first thing John said to me, I hope you have some big pieces of this textile because it's very valuable in the art market today. And besides that, Gerhard, it's not Qing Dynasty. This is from the Ming Dynasty, late 1700s. So that was exciting. So I decided to use this theme of migration. The first panel, 
on the image to the left is the onset of the journey. Do you see the flower up at the top? That flower is on my original textile. I use it like the angel kind of guarding the whole, guiding the whole uh, journey. The central panel is about mid journey. And I have a, 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 a stool in the front there where the guests can sit there and the abstracted flower, which is like at the prow of the ship forms a headdress for them. And then the third panel is the arrival in Portugal which is kind of a, an object, the objective was to create a sense of ah, wonderment about seeing something that you didn't know about before, but then the question is, what do you do with it? So there are several layers of translucency involved in the last panel. And then finally, I thought I've got to bring the whole project back to my studio in Pontiac. So what I'm looking at here is a wall of 28 kites. They're silk kites and the image is the image of downtown Pontiac, Michigan, which I've colored, as you can see from an old map, superimposed the flower that was part of the journey in the beginning, along with those blue discs, to try to give a feeling as though the viewer is up in space, floating over the city of, of Pontiac. And this entire project will be given to 28 business leaders at a special event, which we'll have this fall. Uh, I intend to tell them about the, uh, the, the project and then give the 28 parts away and with the caveat that each of them has to show the place, show the park in somewhere in their commercial buildings on Main Street in Pontiac, the piece never to come back together again. So it's like the experience that I had in discovering the first fragment to begin with. And wow. <laughs> That's amazing. So, so um, minglings is really, oh, and then uh, I discovered, oh, well, this is more story. Uh, on the right-hand side are among, uh, between February 21st and May 5th, I did one drawing each day uh, based on a flower. It was that flower in the textile that I just talked about with abstractions fl uh, floating over flower pots and in an envelope behind them are fragments and the text from the New York Times, front page of the New York Times, collected every day during those days, February 21st to May 5th, the year 2020. And the abstraction of flowers was, I discovered a relative and in, in a beautiful quilt that was made in China, uh, and the abstraction was so gorgeous. I bought the quilt, took it apart, and superimposed vellum and flower pots on the thing and included my flower and images that are drawn from the original Chinese textile. So again, it's an attempt to create a fusion, all shown against a handwoven textile, which unites all of the components together. So all of this is in your new book, Mingling, right? Mm -hmm. And where can people? And there are there are about there are about seventy five pieces in the in the series. So I've okay. shown you. Six. Where can people find your book? To be determined. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. But he will let you know. He will. Yes. Thank you very much. All right, much we've got asking. people chomping at the bit to yeah, ask okay. questions. So let's Perfect. ask a few questions. How's that? Sure. All right. Um, of course, Rebecca Smith wants to know, can you talk about the weavings behind you? Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's a textile that I wove years ago. It is on a Mylar warp. It has uh, those printed tapes that I talked about and other materials, silk primarily, threads. Uh, it is a interesting textile because viewed as you may be seeing it, do you see uh, the sense of branches, tree branches and so on? If you walk to the side of it, those completely disappear. The reflections absorb the, the image so that when I hang this textile on the wall upstairs opposite the window and there's a lake outside the window, 
the light bounces off of this textile and during the day, it's a source of light within the room. And it, as it turns into the evening, one begins to move more and more into the images themselves. So it again has that kind of sense of a textile which is alive. All right. Um, Connie Yates asked, and I'm not sure which piece of work she's talking about. She said, do you have artists working for you, helping with all the labor? Do you have people that stay with you and work with you all the time, or do you bring them in as needed? Uh, years ago, when I did the architectural work, I did have uh, people helping me. Okay. Uh, oftentimes, students recruited, you know, 15 people in the studio at one time on a Saturday afternoon, uh, being paid $5 an hour, whatever it was, uh, slave labor, but we got the job done. Uh, no, it, that that was really great. And uh, for for a number of years, I did have someone on a part-time basis. Since I left Cranbrook, I have had no one. I've done all of that the work myself, purposefully. I was intending to be the be totally responsible for everything that you looked at. You know, we're living in a period of time where farming out the making of things to other people is a very common experience that a lot of artists are working with. That's how they produce these vast shows and vast numbers of works. I decided, no, at this age, I'm going to do it myself. Oh, uh, Betsy Blosser wants to know, where is the Pontiac Tapestry home? It is not, it's in my studio. Oh, okay. It was shown at the opening <laughs> opening of the American Craft Museum in New York and a couple of other places. And then G General Motors was going to buy it for their complex in here in Michigan. And things just, the, the communications got very thin and it ended up rolled up in my big closet <laughs> where I have a few other things from the past. Um, if you're interested, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um. You may have answered this, but let me double check. Check. Laurel Schwartz wants to know, um, when you're talking about minglings, the migration and what the technique is, did you go over that? I'm not sure which one was the migration. The, the, well, the migration was really about the fact that the textile was made in China, but it migrated right. all the way to Portugal. And what I was thinking about at the time was how interesting my observation of this was simultaneously with the migration that was going on in the bigger world. I mean, people leaving North Africa and all the people that uh, tried to get across the Mediterranean to Greece or to Italy, one disaster after the next. But I decided rather than migration being the subject of disaster, of tragedy, why not think about what migrates with people who leave one place and go to another? That's the way beauty migrates in our world. Um, as people take traditions of folk costumes, uh, technologies and textile technologies and ex et cetera with them. Thank you for asking that because it's an important part of that project. Um, somebody wants to know, and I'm sure she's not the only one, what was the loom you were working on in that photo? Uh, it's an, uh, uh, what is the loom? It's a... Is it a Maycomber? Maycomber, excuse me. <laughs> yes, Maycomber. And it's a double beam, right? Double back it, beam? It is a double back beam, and then I back another loom up to it so I can use two more beams in addition to that. Really? Uh, it works beautifully. Yes, I've done it a lot because of the differences in tension with uh, the diverse materials that I oftentimes incorporate into the works. Oh, that's great. Um, I can't find the question, but somebody else was asking, was one beam the, the, like the ground and then another beam was the pattern? Do you separate them out like that on your two beams? Or is it a, a mixture of everything? Depending no, on the, the two beams are really to hold uh, yarns of different tensions. Okay. The, the okay. mylar has a completely different uh, uh, tension to it than wood, uh, cotton, or linen, or silk, or whatever. So that, for that reason, I separate the two. 
Uh, Karen LeBlanc would like to know, do you prefer tapestry or harness weaving? And also, have you done jacquard? I have, I, I have never made a tapestry. <laughs> Does that answer that question? That answers the first part. <laughs> I guess, right. Um, so I usually work with, you know, up to 16 harnesses on, on the loom. Uh, and uh, so that has met my needs there. And what was the other question? And Jacquard, I've, yeah. I've worked with, thanks to uh, some very wonderful projects. Bhakti Zeet did a wonderful project at Philadelphia College of Textiles uh, years ago that was wonderful. And another one happened at RISD. And so I was able to explore those techniques and would love to do more of it, but ah, time is too short. What proportion of your work is for commissions? That's from Susan Caton. Uh, year, years ago, all of the architectural projects were commissioned. Uh, so someone would call, they would say, I have a building in Dallas. Uh, we need something, our world headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut, <laughs> Xerox, are you interested? And they would send me some information about it and I'd look into it. And then uh, of course, finally uh, develop a proposal and uh, con then eventually a contract for the whole thing. So, you know, that's the way it, it works. It's a business. Of, relationship because there's so much invested in spending a year of one's life to do big work of that sort. Oh, I love this question. This is from Joan Diamond. Do you think big is where it's at? Have you worked on similar scale, on, on a smaller scale, or do you feel your ideas naturally work big on a bigger scale? Or better well, I, hope, scale? I hope you can see it through a few of the images that I've shown that I work in a wide, wide variety of ways. Uh, Big is in, uh, as anyone who looks at contemporary art knows. Installation art is very popular right now. And uh, because many people are working in teams, it makes larger works possible. Besides, they really grab your attention, right? Um, anyway, I, I love large scale, but also, as you saw with the drawings and other some of the other pieces I did, they are at, at a... Uh, at, at a smaller size. And that is more manageable, of course, as I'm working individually, independently um, to produce the work in the space of the studio. We, we always ask us, of most of our guests, is how do you come up with your design? Do you draw it out by hand? Do you use a computer? Because Sally Forelli was saying, how much do you use digital technology? Uh, I don't use it very much. I like drawing very, very much. And most things really begin with, uh, with drawings. Um, I find that uh, my hand and the pencil or whatever the means is that I'm using to draw, kind of the, the, the contact of the pencil with the paper has a mind of its own sometimes and kind of you know, you work and you sketch, it's, it, it, it goes so beautifully. And I don't like the idea of a lot of technology getting in the way of the whole thing. The whole notion of having to adapt something to a loom is enough, you know. And everything that I do requires, has a lot of technique uh, involved in it. But the advantage is, of course, to be smart enough about the techniques that you're using so you can forget them and the whole thing flows like crazy, which is why most people say with one or two techniques for most of their lives and don't do a lot of migration from one thing to the next. Well, we have two questions about the Mylar. Barbara Walker and Sherry Silverson, Silverson sorry, Sherry. Um, how do you make your Mylar warp? And then how do you control the tension on the, on the warp? Uh, how do I make the mylar warp? The same way you would warp for a hand loom on a warping reel. It, it works the same way. The, the spools of mylar are on, are on a frame and I use the warping reel for that purpose. And the, the tension, uh, fortunately the mylar has elasticity. So uh, it, 
until it's tied up, it, it you know, requires a little bit of control to hold, hold its position in the sequence if you're doing like, uh, you know, 16 or 32 ends per inch, et cetera, and making a warp that's, you know, uh, 50 inches wide. But, um, but once it's tied up, it really behaves and it has a way of um, re repairing itself in the process. If there are a few loose threads, they will be caught up in the process of weaving. And, uh, you know, I found it to be quite agreeable. Thank you so much. I can't believe we're at the end. I know I say that every week, but it just amazes me. It goes so fast. Like you have been so generous with your time and your knowledge and just telling us about all your work. Thank you so much for being here today. I do appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. If you want to know more about Gerhard and his work, please go to his website. It's a wealth of knowledge there. You'll, you'll see so much. You'll learn more about his new book. And uh, you can see everything about his work, um, past and present, at gnodal.com. When I say a special thanks to our sponsor, um, Schiffer Publishing, not only does Schiffer publish Gerhard's book, What If Textiles, it's heavy, it's a good book. And um, for most of us, the books that we love, we wear out, we use all the time, they're our favorites, are published by Schiffer. So go to their website. They publish books on everything. Any topic you can come up with, you'll probably see it at Schiffer Publishing. Um, if you or one of your, if your guild or your business would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea, please, you'll get more information at our website at wespindie.org. Textiles and Tea is supported by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, please donate or join at wespindie.org. If you've missed any of this today, you want to watch it again, I know I will, uh, you can watch any of the past Textiles and Tea on the HTA Facebook page. You do not have to have a Facebook account, but you can go on there and watch any of the past episodes, including today's. Next week, we are excited to welcome Majita Clark. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you again, uh, Gerdard. It's so nice to have you here. And I hope you all have a wonderful week. Happy tea. <laughs>